This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Yes. Good. Well, um, Sir Adrian Smith um, is uh, one of has had one of the most extraordinary careers um, I know. Um, and by my age, I not had at least known people with quite a lot of um, extraordinary careers. Um, it's extraordinary because of the way he has moved around at very specific <coughs> positions in institutions which normally hang on to people for life. Um, so uh, he's extremely uh, eminent academic and a fellow of the Royal Society uh, for his uh, um, academic work on statistics. Um, he's also uh, headed one of London's great colleges, Queen Mary College, for many years. Um, and that would be quite enough for most academic careers. But um, uh, in addition to that, he has worked in the civil service at a very, very senior level. And uh, the, I don't know how much all of you know about the British civil service, but um, uh, despite um, some attempts to politicize it over the last decade, still, I think one of the most impressive organizations in the world and uh, um, uh, 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 the elite elites in many ways. Um, so he played a part in that. Um, but since then, he has moved to become vice chancellor of the university in which you are sitting. And at the same time, um, to be, uh, I sometimes think, the active ingredient in the official statistics authority, um, the precise nature of which I only recently understood talking to him, and it sounds to me like one of the most um, salutary institutions that we have at the moment. So um, you're hearing about statistics from somebody who has used them in action, um, not an academic who uses them, as it were, at some distance from actual decision making. Somebody who's used them in action, but also is a master of the theory. So um, this is one talk that I'm certainly very much looking forward to myself. So Sir Adrian. Well, thank you for that very myself around. generous um, introduction. Um, normally when people change jobs regularly, it's because um, they've been asked to move on or told to move around or, or whatever. So um, take that with a slight pinch of salt. I'm going to sit down if that's all right. That will work with the... Okay, so it's just easier to, to sort of see the, the screen. So, okay. I know, um, I've seen the cast list of the, the various people who've talked to you in this series. So I, I was invited wearing the particular hat of Deputy Chair of the Statistics Authority. So what I will choose to focus on, because I know others have talked about um, other sort of issues, I will talk about uh, official statistics. That is to say, numbers that have been produced in or for government um, in some sense counting and measuring <coughs> the state of the economy and, and society. And I will talk about a number of issues in and around that. I'm not going to talk technical statistics at any point, but I will show a few pictures. So the key themes that I'm going to focus on in this talk to try and um, balance it with what you've heard in other things is the role of, of statistics and its connection with public policy. Virtually all debates in Parliament, virtually all decisions that are made ultimately in government departments or by government agencies, somewhere along the line somebody will have tried to demonstrate the correctness of their position by appealing to numbers in some shape or form. All right. So the connection of numbers, counts, measurements uh, with policy is fundamental. But it's fundamental in two different ways. It, it informs decisions, so you would like, the famous phrase is you would like evidence-based policy rather than what ministers want, which is policy-based evidence. And so evidence-based policy is very important to inform government policy and decisions. But in a parliamentary democracy, both Parliament and the general public need to be able to assess the quality of those decisions and to challenge them. So the numbers are not just for the use of government or civil servants. 
They are there for the general population, for opinion formers, for the press, investigative journalists, to poke and prod the workings of the democracy. So numbers are pretty fundamental uh, in this context. Now that guy uh, was a, a permanent secretary in the civil service called um, Michael Scholar. His son, Tom Scholar, is a treasury official as we speak. And he was the first chair of the authority. And I'll tell you a bit more about the authority in a moment. Um, so we statisticians wax very poetical when we talk about statistics. So he went a bit over the top. Um, it's basically, if, if sound money is fundamental to the running of the economy and clean water is fundamental to a healthy population, then statistics are are fundamental to the working of, of democracy. And this guy, uh, Hans Rosling, um, making the point that statistics are not just um, the bookkeeping for the civil service or ministers or whatever, um, everybody has to be engaged with these numbers because fundamental decisions that affect your life and your future are made on the basis. Um, it was somebody like H.G. Wells, I think, who might say that statistical thinking will be as important to the citizen for the future or something like this. So I think there are real problems, actually, with numeracy in the general public and understanding of numbers. And the real danger is that people get cynical. Uh, you know, the old stuff, you can prove anything with statistics, lies, damn lies, statistics. Um, complete nonsense, in a sense. It is only honest clear numbers that keep governments honest and make quality decisions. So poor old statistics get a bad name, but they're actually as important as clean water. Okay, so the UK statistical system, the official s system in the UK, has really two bits. There is an organization called the Office for National Statistics, and that's the big producer of the big key numbers the numbers that come out of the census, right? the numbers that say how many people there are in the country, what the age distribution is, how many people live in the households, etc., etc., and monitor the trends of that. A lot of political debate, the functioning of the government is economic growth, so the measurement of GDP, absolutely uh, fundamental. Uh, inflation, another key kind of item of political debate what's the level of inflation. These are measured by price indices, and different price indices measure different things. So retail price index, RPI, claims to do what it does, which is measure what's happening to retail prices. Consumer price index, um, looked at from the other, other way around, what, what are the effects on kind of people? The problem with retail price indices is that I bet you your shopping basket doesn't look like mine. All right. So if you're into eating steak every day and steak is getting more expensive, you, you will live in a more inflationary environment than me if I only eat carrots and the price of carrots is going down. So in an ideal world, you'd have a price index for every individual, which is clearly nonsense. But the, 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 the inflation index for an undergraduate is very different from the inflation index uh, for an old age pensioner, for example. People with mortgages, uh, in a low interest rate regime have a totally different um, reaction to inflation. So these measures are very important and measures of the labor market, how many people are employed, um, rates of crime, and I'll talk a bit more about that. And recently, quite interestingly, um, if you look at it from a, a sort of humanities point of view, th there's a move to say that you don't just know how well a country is doing or what people are feeling by measuring economic variables like GDP. So uh, Richard Layard at LSE and others have kind of argued that we need an index of well-being. So, so somehow what you care about is that people are feeling good, right? I mean, the economy might be going downhill, but um, if you're on an island and the bananas are free and the sun is shining, you know, you might not feel so terrible. But if you're living in an inner city slum and all you've got to eat is bananas and it's raining, you might feel differently about it. So is, a, is the economic measure sufficient or do we need more subtle things. Things like um, employment rates are proxies because we know that in general people are, uh, feel terrible and are unhappy if they're unemployed and want to be employed, but is there a way of measuring it directly? So the Office for National Statistics 
deals with all the technicalities of how you count and measure and assemble these kind of important numbers for government. And I'll talk about some of them a bit more later on. So those are the, the kind of central numbers, like GDP affects all of us across the economy. They're the big economic numbers. But of course you've got other government departments, Department for Transport, Department for Health, Department for the Environment. And for specific policies in those areas, you know, maybe breast cancer rates or, or stuff in health or um, cost of rail fares for the Department of Transport. There are a lot of other numbers in government that the individual departments need for policy making and for um, holding departments to account. So in each government department, in addition to the Central Office for National Statistics, which is now based partly in London but partly in Newport, packed full of, of, of technical statisticians, each government department also has some statisticians whose main job is to work with ministers and policy makers uh, to provide the statistical support within the individual departments. And that, that group of statisticians across all the other government departments is known as the government statistical service. At the top of that, there is a person, it, it's a, a woman at the moment, Jill Matheson, but she's stepping down this summer, who's called the national statistician. And the national statistician job is enshrined in legislation and basically is the head of the profession for all the statisticians employed in government. And there is a code of practice which basically says no statistician can be asked to fiddle the numbers. And if any minister asks or puts pressure on a statistician now in a government department to fiddle the numbers, that, that individual can go to the national statistician and the national statistician can whistle blow on, on what's happening and report to the authority. So the national statistician is the, is the kind of, you know, keeper of, of the honesty of the, uh, the profession. So think of these two bits, the central mainly economic stuff but also crime and the rest spread across government. Now, many of you won't kind of remember either because you're too young or you weren't in the country or whatever but about 20 years ago maybe more 25 years ago in this this country there was a really big issue because politically uh, the the rate of employment or unemployment was the hottest political issue in the land and the government of the time um, about every month rejig the definitions of unemployment. You may remember this, yes. right? And it, it, it totally poisoned the political process because you couldn't have a proper debate about what was happening because you didn't know, you know, they kept changing the definition of what you were counting and measuring. And it gave a terrible name to, to statistics in general. So there was a lot of noise. I was once upon a time president of the Royal Statistical Society in the mid-1990s. And I think it was around that early 90s or whatever, around that time that there was a big national consensus that we needed to get the ownership and fiddling of the data, as it were, out of the political process and get it into a more neutral, protected space. Because if you buy the idea that statistics are fundamental both for decision making and for holding government to account and for the general public to be well educated in a democracy, then you've got to be able to trust the numbers. Right? the way they're produced, the way they're presented, and I'll talk about some of that later on. So, six years ago now, seven years maybe, there was an act of parliament which set up this organization called the UK Statistics Authority. And it's a totally independent body in the sense it's not located in any government department. There is no minister who owns it. And it reports directly to parliament. And there's a, there's a select committee in Parliament to which we report directly. We have the power to publicly name and shame any government minister, including the Prime Minister, if they mess about with the numbers. So don't mess with us, right? That's the message. Uh, so we've got two main functions. Trusting numbers, of course, they've got to be produced well. They've got to have high quality. They've got to use the best techniques. They've got to have the right size surveys, whatever, whatever. So two functions. One 
is oversight of the Office for National Statistics, the main producer of the big numbers, and I actually chair the board for the ONS, so I oversee the production of the numbers. And then, like a Chinese wall within the authority, there is a, an in, a scrutiny, monitoring and assessment function which can choose to look at any numbers at all produced anywhere in government and challenge their quality, their fitness for purpose, uh, the use that's made of them by ministers and so on and so forth. So there's an assessment function and a production function and the other deputy chair, um, David Rind, who used to be vice chancellor of City University, he chairs the bit that looks after the assessment function. And we have non-executive directors who come from business or um, media or wherever who sit on the board and no non-exec director overlaps. So you are either looking at the production function or you're looking at the assessment function and you don't confuse the two. So the strategic priorities of the authority, remembering that it's got two basic functions, the, the production of data and the, the, the assessment and monitoring and scrutiny of, of data. So it's got to be concerned about quality. We're not producing numbers as some academic exercise. These numbers are for something. They're for, for producing policies, they're for monitoring policies. So you want to produce numbers that actually have an impact on society and on the economy. Um, all organizations that, that, that are anything to do with, with public domain never have enough money. So you want to make sure that whatever you're doing, you do in the most efficient way. And some of that is technical, like wh what size surveys do you need to conduct to be sure that you've got the right sort of answer, but you don't want to overkill and waste money. So there are efficiency issues. Do we cover all the right things? So. Uh, you know, from time to time, I mean, just suppose we didn't have an environment agency and just suppose we didn't have a Met office, you know, and so it rains and nobody knows what's happening or, you know, how much of the country is flooded or whatever, whatever. So you never know quite what will come up. And then you get health scares like um, bugs, super bugs in hospitals and so on. And of course, everybody expects that you understand what goes on. Well, you only understand what goes on if you're countering and measuring stuff. So you're constantly having to think of the coverage. What, what range of things do we need to count and measure so that we're, you know, we're preempting, in some sense, all the debates that might take place about societal issues? And ultimately, and really importantly, trustworthiness. Let's say all political process and debate is poisoned if you don't have some hard set of numbers around which to have the debate. So if everybody uses a different set of numbers or they're not comparable or uh, whatever, um, in some sense the whole nature of debate in parliamentary democracy falls aside. So I know it's a rather grandiose claim, but actually producing high quality, impactful numbers in the most efficient way, covering all the things people want to know and doing it in a way that the general population and government can trust the numbers that come out. That's what the authority is, is about, okay? So let me just say briefly something under uh, each of those. I don't know if you can read that, but I'll, I'll say it. Um, <coughs> of course, all countries around the world, or all developed countries, also have the same processes and the same needs to count and measure things. So in some sense, there's an international community um, originally an academic community, which, which has in, in a, deep academic, a, a deep set of academic knowledges about what, what are the right ways to measure GDP, what are the right ways to construct price indices, and that's where it gets into the very technical mathematical uh, kind of arena. And so there is an international community that shares best practice of how you count and measure all this kind of stuff. So uh, we, we, the authority is partly charged with making sure that everything we do in producing numbers is done to the highest international standards as far as possible. In terms of impact, sorry, this keeps repeating the irritating the uh, setup. I hope you hate PowerPoint as much as I do. Um, 
It's no good producing the numbers, however, if you don't get the messages out there, either to ministers or to the general public. So how, th there's a huge issue around communicating numbers. You know, I can have the finest mathematical formula in the world, and I'm so proud of my number that represents inflation. Um, but if I don't tell you about it, or I don't tell you about it in the right way, and the right way often involves a huge amount of caveats, because you have to understand what's the difference between the retail price index, consumer price index. These are quite subtle things. Um, when we come, I'll talk a little bit about crime stats in a minute. Uh, when you come to communicating this, this stuff, the communication is, is, a, is a really fundamental part of, of the process. So to ensure that things have impact, they have to be understood, and the right kind of people have to have access to those numbers. I have to do this irritating thing mm -hmm. over and over. I'll kill the person who did these things. Um, and because ultimately it's public money which is funding this, although we're independent, I mean, we do have to go to the Treasury on a regular basis to get the budget for the um, authority. The, the current budget for the authority is around 150 million. Um, every 10 years you do a census, and this, the census itself costs another half a billion um, to do. So these are quite big sums of money. Um, by government standards, they're not enormous. Um, but they are big sums of money, so if you kind of wasted 10% of it by do it, collecting the wrong numbers in the wrong way, you know, you've blown 15 million. So you are held to account by parliamentary committees for doing this in the most efficient way possible. And one of the interesting issues I'll mention a little bit later on is when you do a census, you know, I don't know if any of you have been on the receiving end of this, either here or in other countries, but here, you know, somebody comes to your door with 20 sheets of paper and asks you hundreds of questions and you kind of fill it in. And some of those questions about where you live, how many children you have, etc., etc. Of course, some people would argue, well, you know, everybody registers with a doctor. And the doctor has all your information about where you live and how many children you have. And, uh, so if we were to tap all the kind of administrative data that's collected for other reasons in the school, schools know who goes to school, where they live and how old they are and so on, you know, could we not build up the composition of families from stuff we've already collected for other purposes? So there's a big argument about how much you need to do over and above the administrative data you already have. So it's a no-brainer, except that, of course, in order to use that administrative data, you'd have to link it together, the school data with the doctor data. You can't link data unless you say whose data it is, so you're immediately up against privacy and data protection. In order to link data to get a picture of society, you have to not an anonymize it because you have to know it's the same person's data you're linking. So one of the big arguments at the current time is that the, the trade-off between efficiently knowing the things you want to know about society and not being able to know them because of data protection or concerns about privacy or, or uh, loss of data. So it's quite an interesting set of issues there. So one can't necessarily do things in the most efficient value for money ways because other things like data protection laws can get in the way. So just bear that in mind. While I tap the machine another four times. Okay. So the coverage issue um, is, is really quite interesting because within a statistical system, because it takes a while to set up systems and collect data and so on, you need a gang of people who are really let loose just to sort of think silly thoughts. You know, what, what kind of things will we want to know about society in four or five years' time? Okay? So you get a change of legislation, say same-sex mar marriage. I mean, there's no such thing before the legislation, and then after the legislation, somebody in a few years' time will want to know about the numbers and the trends in same-sex marriage. So all of a sudden, you've got to put in place new ways of capturing data. Uh, people, medical advances. Once upon a time, I mean, we still have it in the language, we talk about diabetes type 1 and diabetes type 2, right? 
recent genetic advantage, there are 16 types of diabetes. So suddenly, all the systems and the categories that you use are thrown up in the air uh, because the new, you know, let's say diabetes type 7 is because a particular gene is defective in a particular way. So somebody's trying to invent ways of dealing with that. Well, in five years' time, somebody will want to know how effective that is. But of course, we never collected such data because we only thought there were two types of diabetes. So these, these are really kind of interesting issues about changes in, 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 in social activity like marriage definitions, changes in medical research which throw up new disease categories and associations. And finally, trustworthiness, which in some ways might be the most important um, of all. Um, what kind of things are involved in, in trustworthiness? Well, some of us would argue that until we have this independent authority that was independent of ministers, you don't have a chance. Because if crime statistics are, are owned by the Home Office, and we'll come on to it in a minute, or by the police, you've already got a problem because they've got a, you know, if you're the, the Home Secretary, you want to be able to stand up and say crime rates are going down. But if you own the data, people will say, well, you would say that. You know, you know. So having some independent place to stand is fundamental. Then you need very high levels of professionalism because, I, believe me, I mean, it, it is non-trivial to say what you mean by gross domestic product or what do you mean by balance of trade. See, in the old days, you made something in Britain, you stuck it in a ship, and at the port they write down what you did, then the other end they'd buy it and you'd know what money came back. What does tr balance of trade in and out mean in an era where you've got um, internet and e-commerce? You get an item made in one country, put on eBay in another country, sold to somebody in a third country, and then there's a row about the quality or something, so it goes through a legal process in a fifth company and some resolution is made in a mediation court in a sixth country. But what happened, right? So a lot of this stuff is, is pretty tricky. So you need not just independence, but you need a huge degree of, of actual technical professionalism. Um, and you need this sort of, uh, the, the, the general kind of openness and integrity that goes with, you were kind enough to say, the values that have still been maintained in general in, in the civil service. Um, but you mustn't underestimate the pressure that civil service can come under from ministers to, you know, if they're found to be difficult, their careers might be. So the beautiful thing now about the statistics profession in government is that they, they, I can't say they cannot come under such pressure, but they don't come under such pressure because if ministers tried to apply it, the whistle would be blown, the watchdog would come in, and letters would be written. And I'll mention a few of those uh, in a minute. So where, where this, the trustworthy thing also comes up there's a lot of sensitivity at the moment about privacy of data. Yeah? And, you know, Snowden, GCHQ, etc., etc. It's very odd that the public is so sensitive about government agencies like GCHQ, which are actually there to protect the public, They're very sensitive about that information, and people are totally oblivious to the data that's collected on you every time you go into the internet by Google or by Facebook or you go shopping in Tesco's. Tesco's knows much more about you than the government does. <laughs> Reflect on that. <coughs> so some of the recent um, watchdog uh, interventions um, started, why don't we start with the Prime Minister? The Prime Minister made a speech in which he said that the, the economic policy was successful and government debt is being paid down. Debt is actually increasing. What was actually happening is the, the deficit, the annual deficit rate is coming down. But until it's not a deficit, it's adding to the debt. So he didn't understand the difference between <laughs> deficit and debt. This is the Prime Minister of the UK. Uh, just to be even had this being filmed, so I have to be careful. Um, just to be even-handed then, the leader of the um, opposition, Ed Miliband, uh, took um, a, a load of youth unemployment figures, right? And uh, these are not the exact figures, I'm making it up because I can't remember the exact figures. 
But the youth unemployment, however defined, in the UK was 980,000. In Spain, it was 965,000. So Miliband said, this terrible government, our youth, un youth unemployment here is even worse than Spain, and we know what a basket case the Spanish economy is. What, what did he do wrong? I mean, the absolute number is, is meaningless. You have to do it as a, as a rate, of, a population rate, okay? Uh, and if you do it as a population rate, um, in, in the UK it was about 9.5% and in Spain it was 42% or something <coughs> like that. And if you ranked on the youth unemployment rates, uh, Spain I think was second. There was somebody who even beat Spain, I can't remember, Greece maybe. Um, but the UK was like 30th or whatever. So, you know, and um, IDS stands for Ian Duncan Smith. He is the Secretary of State for um, Work and Pensions. And they are changing the benefit system. I mean, the big mantra of the government at the moment is by reducing benefits available to people, they'll all go to work instead and not be idle and sit around at home smoking and watching television or whatever. Mm -hmm. Whatever most of us do if we can. Um, and he introduced this change. And then there was a, a, a decrease shortly after in the unemployment rate. So he claimed that the changes to the benefit system had sent more people back uh, into work. Um, in fact, the unemployment rate figures, there's a time lag, because it takes a while to collect all these things from the offices. The unemployment figures referred to a period before he introduced his uh, policy, et cetera. Now, the beauty of the authorities, we write public letters to these guys. And there's, the, there's one to the prime minister. So. That time you understood the deficit. The deficit. Um, a recent one that you might or might not have been following relates to crime statistics. And crime statistics, um, you know, might not impinge much on your daily life, but um, it's a toxic one, you know, for, for newspapers and politicians to use, particularly the Daily Mail. You know, if you want to, if you want to rubbish some politicians, you say the crime rate has gone up under this government. So what, what is, what is, how do you measure crime? Well, basically in this country there are two different ways you could measure crime. Every time, in theory, every time there's a crime, a policeman makes a note of that. So say that this happened at this time, in this place, and then the policeman has a series of boxes, you know, ranging from murder to assault, burglary. So there's, there's a series of categories. So in theory, every time something happened, the police record it, you should have a perfect record of crime. What's the flaw in that? Two flaws. One, you'll only know about it if somebody reports it. And I don't know if you know, but most of the shops on Oxford Street don't report um, what do you call it, shoplifting? There are all sorts of reasons for that. And, and a lot of individuals who, who've been subject to assault, sexual assault, a lot of people don't report it. So, uh, because they don't want to interact with the police or they don't think the police will investigate properly or, or whatever. Or it will affect their insurance if you're a shop on Oxford Street. That's one flaw. Anybody think of another flaw? You're reliant on the police recording it accurately. Now, the police, like many other um, agencies, have their own targets set on which they're judged, but on which their performance is judged. So you have the dangerous situation of an organization which is going to be judged on the numbers, writing down the numbers. Okay? so. For two reasons, the police recorded crime is a bit flaky. So instead, there is a huge survey that's done, a random survey of people, and you go into households, and because you're now distant from the experience of the crime, you're not having to interact with the police, it's all totally anonymized, 
you get people to tell you if they've been subject in the last 12 months or members of the household to a crime. And you write down, you've got sur survey people who know exactly how to write it down and collect it. So you've got a, a, a crime survey. What has happened um, in recent times, and I don't know if you can um, kind of read that, you probably can't, um, <clears throat> but it, just think there are, there are two kind of trend lines you could see in time. What happened to police recorded crime? What happened to uh, the survey? And you can see that the trends don't necessarily match up. And if you look at the ratios of the two, you can see somewhere over time, they kind of got out of sync. They're telling two different stories here. There's something really odd happening. And um, as I say, the, the problem, one of the problems with the police ones is they've got targets. So, you know, the more crimes they record and clear up, etc., you know, they, they're regarded as doing a better job and so on. So um, what, what happened, the Stats Authority um, MPs challenged this stuff, you know, what's happening, what are we going to do about it? And um, what the authority did was actually remove, there's, there's a, um, a kind of quality mark that the authority gives. To be counted as national official statistics, the authority assessment function has to sign it off as being of appropriate quality, trustworthiness, etc. And what we did was we removed that gold mark from the police recorded crime. So that um, figured quite a lot in um, the newspapers um, recently. The, the survey is, is a terrific survey. It tell, you know, from all statistical perspectives, it's, it's well tested and it tells the story. Everything was getting confused because it's like you've got two sets of numbers telling you a different story. Uh, it's led that and things like um, bad language in the gates of Downing Street. It's led to a lot of distrust recently in police um, performance. So from the authority point of view, it's very dangerous if, if statistics aren't trusted and there's a lot of noise. So we just have now said, don't believe the, the police crime data. Um, it's a shame because actually that could be a terrific source of data. But until we get standardization between police forces, and until they do something like the banks do, bad example, I know, but in the good old days, the banks had a front of house and a back of house. And if you were involved in front of house transactions, you couldn't be involved in recording those transactions. And those who recorded the record of what happened were not involved in the thing. And a lot of the crap that's happened in recent times is because people have, have gone across that divide. I mean, the collapse of bearings was the trader was fiddling the, the, the book. Um, so until we get a front office and a back office back in the, the police, um, you're going to have to use the, the crime survey. Um, so that, there's an example of the watchdog function. In terms of, of major national debates, I mentioned um, briefly the, the census. We, we need to know who's in the country, how many, growth of families, the, the pictures of health, and so on and so forth. So. Uh, this is, you go to every house in the country, in theory, right? And you fill in 30 pages of stuff. So this is an exhaustive thing. But it's very expensive. You know, you've got field forces of thousands out there. A lot of households, if they're watching the telly and can't be bothered to answer, they have to go back three or four times. You, have to, you know, um, And it's done every 10 years. And you might say that in recent times, technological changes, the internet, uh, migration, uh, there are a lot of factors which mean there's much more churn in society, a faster rate of churn, than is sensible to measure every 10 years. So it's expensive. Is every 10 years sensible? Is there not a better way of getting a picture of, of what's happening uh, in society? So the stuff you get, you know, you get these male, female, population, age, distributions. You get enormous amounts of data about families, about birth rates, and so on. And these are fundamental pieces of data. I'm not expecting you to. So. These are fundamental pieces of data for all government departments. If you're planning health services, if you're planning school places, if you're planning transport, you need to know all these kind of things, right? The major thing it doesn't have, and is a highly toxic politically, is internal migration figures. So if you want to know 
how many Romanians live in the southwest versus the northeast or the doesn't exist so and there's an example of the coverage thing um, years ago you and, and it was part of the I think in UK national psyche you didn't keep track of if people moved around the country you need a certain amount of that data at aggregate level for planning schools and the rest but you didn't break it down into who it was and where they'd moved from and now there's a lot of sensitivity around migration so we actually do not have we do not have a good measurement system for immigration and internal migration. Don't have it. And that's quite a bone of contention at the current time. Anyway, back to the census. Um, what are we going to do in, in the future? Does it make sense to go around door to door with a load of paperwork? Well, number one, you might say, why on earth don't you do it online? So Canada's already started on this, and they say, well, you can't do it online. There are old people who haven't got you know, access to a computer. Or people will lie, or you know, won't be able to check it. Canada's already embarked on that, and, th and they, they get a 16% non-response rate online. So you have to go back and do that the old-fashioned way, but 16% is a sixth, roughly, so you've cut the bill by a sixth. By Five, six. So that's attractive, but it's still only once a decade. Um, well, you might kind of roll it a bit, you know, you could do 10% of the population one year and a different 10% the next and so on and so forth. Uh, and you can use all this other data that exists in government, in, in the health service, in the school system, um, passenger surveys of people going to work labor force survey um, so where we're at at the moment is the proposal going forward is we will run the next census uh, that's 2021 primarily online but then we will supplement it by trying to get a public consensus around what uh, that we can use administrative data it requires legislation to be able to link it and the current state of public feeling about um, data privacy is so sensitive that it's probably not worth trying at the current time because there's this thing with with the health service at the moment I don't know if you followed the debate that if you could get all the data out of general practitioner um, what do they call it? wherever general practitioners are surgeries um, and you link that to the hospital data we would have an incredible database against which to, to, to conduct medical research, which would um, speed up incredibly a lot of diagnostic and other things. But, you know, newspapers are running a campaign about, you know, this is, we might lose the data, data privacy, do you really want your medical records out? You know, because occasionally people lose you know, computer sticks or something, and you find that Barclays bank details of 10,000 customers are out there. Uh, people maybe don't care too much if you, to know you've got an overdraft, but they might care a lot about your medical records. So there are hugely sensitive cultural things that need to be worked on if we're to be able to do these things in a, in a much more, I mean, I would say as a statistician, sensible way. But um, you, you do need to reassure the public that we, we, we can do this without... Um, compromising privacy and it's a major major debate issue I think going forward it's a cultural issue okay that, that's an example of a big debate where statistics is at the heart of it counting and measuring the nature of the country um, I mentioned earlier communication um, the issue that all this doesn't work unless we work we know how to communicate it uh, in the right kind of way. Well, what are the issues around communication? One of the issues is that because, unless you're trying to do a census, um, all you get is partial information. If you do a survey, you go out and you, you talk to two or three thousand people, well, there are 60 million in the country. So you, you're not getting the total picture. And when you don't get the total picture, you've obviously got some uncertainty in the system. So all statistical estimates really have some uncertainty attached to them. And the communication of uncertainty 
is quite a subtle psychological and sociological issue. Um, in some senses, you know, if you're an expert, people want you to tell it how it is. And politicians always say, don't, I want to know, you know, is it this or is it that? And you can say, well, 80% that, 20% that, they hate it, right? The, the uncertainty. And when you look at, um, and I'll, I'll show you in a minute, the measurement of GDP, politicians are keen to know as soon as possible what's happening to growth. And what you should really say is, well, you'll have to wait five or six months because I need to collect all the past data to see, well, telling me six months later what's I want to know in a month's time. Well, in a month's time, you're probably basing it on 30% of the information. So six months' time, you're going to get a different number. So people say, oh, you got it wrong the first time then, did you? No. That was the estimate, and it, it, what I'm telling you second time round, well within the uncertainty bounds of what I told you the first time round. But this is complicated stuff, but uncertainty is very important. And of course, when you're looking at government, the performance of government or the performance of policies, you're often looking at trends. Did things get better? Did they get worse? Okay? And I just show you some, mainly pictures from now on, um, the, the cunning ways in which you can present trends to tell whatever story you one. Accessibility. Um, can you put the data out there. There's a website. Um, if, if two years ago you had logged into the Office for National Statistics website, unless you were a professional statistician, you would have understood a word of it. So now there's a huge effort that when you log in, you know, there's a map and buttons and you can ask the questions and, you know, whatever level you're entering it. So how do we make things accessible to everybody, not just to professional statisticians? A lot of debate in Parliament and <coughs> government and about the nature of government and that is, how is the UK economy doing versus the rest of Europe? Or in the States, they put in much more of a stimulus package much earlier than us. So if you're, the, if you're Ed Balls or the Labour Party, you <coughs> say, look, look at the United States and put those two curves and you see their growth took off much earlier than us. We told you so, you should have put in the stimulus earlier. So international comparisons are all over the, the place. Um, and, and an often asked question, so how are we doing versus other countries is, is something you, you have to be able to answer. And, uh, the context in which this takes place. Um, some items like, you know, if, if the government is under attack for its record on the economy, then the GDP figures will be well to the fore. If there have been outbreaks of superbugs in hospitals, then that's where the Daily Mail and the newspapers will be focusing. So if, if you're in this sort of business, the context, what's a hot topic today? What's the toxic political topic? Um, is, is often relevant to the way you present the figures. So if something is hot and toxic and politically very sensitive, boy, you'd better make sure you present those in the most neutral kind of way so that nobody can attack. So going back to these individual things, here's um, GDP. And what this shows you is, is the amount of data available. So government, um, current, parliament currently requires the first estimate of what happened in the last quarter in terms of changes of GDP, in other words, growth in the last quarter, it requires it, uh, the first estimate, 25 days after the end of the quarter. By that time, you'll see that less, I think it's about 44%, 42% of the data that you need, the, the, the totality of the data that's gonna be available to you, and it comes from uh, companies, it comes from you know, a series of measures, only 42, 44% is available after 25 days. And without knowing a lot of mathematics, I guess it's obvious to you that the smaller amount of data you have to estimate something, the bigger the uncertainty. And as you acquire more and more data, the uncertainty <coughs> comes down. Um, so the, after 55 days, the Office for National Statistics does a revision. Not a correction, it revises the estimate, because now it's got about two-thirds of three-quarters of the data. Okay? So it's, it knows a lot better what happened in the first quarter. So, you know, the, the estimate based on the, um, the, the 25 days might have been a growth rate of 0.7 or something. But actually, based on that amount of data, it could have been anywhere between 0.5 and 0.9. 
The second estimate, based on a lot more data, might be 0.6. And then, of course, if you're an idiot in the parliamentary thing, you say you got it wrong the first time. You said it was 0.7. Now it's 0.6. You're misleading the government. <coughs> well, the 0.6 would well within the 0.5 to 0.9. You know, it might go up, may go down. And then by three months later, you publish a retrospective um, national account figure, and that rough, you never get the whole data for various reasons. Um, that then becomes the definitive number as to what the growth was in that quarter. All right. But, but because people require this early stuff, they're requiring the statistical system to give them the first number quite uncertain. And then you revise it and you revise it. So revisions are quite proper and everybody understands it. They're not correcting mistakes. So I think we've now almost won that battle with the press to stop them saying that um, the Office for National Statistics has admitted that its first number was wrong. None of these numbers are wrong or right. The last number is as right as it's going to be. But, yeah. So that was GDP, uncertainty. Trends. Sorry, I've got this idiot stuff again. Okay. Um, there's one way of presenting trends in uh, GDP uh, from just after the Second World War up until a couple of years ago. Right? I think that's nice and clear and everybody understands exactly what's happened there that apart from minor kind of ripples since 1948 we've experienced uninterrupted upward economic growth and then in the last um, few years uh, we took a bit of a, a hit. So that kind of trend data puts historical perspective on things, easy to understand. Um, if we just look over the last decade and a bit, so you're sort of focusing in on this, um, you can present the data in this way, um, where you take the, uh, the 2010 data. I mean, this is a, a statistical trick, just to give a scale. Suppose you call the 2010 level 100, right? Then you'll see that prior to that it was less than that and then it went up and it dipped so it's just a way of presenting it however if you do visuals you'll feel okay well you know it wobbled a bit um, but if you expand the scale and do it now down on a quarterly basis rather than aggregated over the, the years you can see in a much more micro way what happened around 2008 and you can track and then if there's any recovery at all, you know, you might start arguing from a certain point. So these things are fundamental meat and drink, you know, in the House of Commons, and they abuse each other and insult each other as to where these things started or whatever. In the international comparator thing, the thing would be if I overlaid the US, you'd see the rise started, the dip wasn't as big, and the rise started sooner. So that would be the graph you'd use if you were the advocates of this government got it wrong by cutting too, too hard, too fast, and didn't put the stimulus in fast enough. So you use it for whatever purpose, but the, the statistical system has to be available to present whatever you want to see. Accessibility. Well, if you... Um, I think this comes from the Ofsted um, website. You log into some websites, and unless you're a kind of expert, what on earth is all that you know, about, and how do I find out what's really going on, and so on. So a major issue for us at the moment is the professionalizing of the communications function in the Office for National Statistics to design a website, which we want eventually to be a model of its kind, that whatever kind of idiot user you are, you go in, there's a simple way of saying what you want to find out about, and it will lead you through in, in various ways. So there are some utter disaster websites around presenting statistics. So we'll move off that as soon as possible. International comparisons. Um, these are the kind of things that um, it, the OECD, the European Commission, um, uh, the um, World Bank look at regularly to, to look at comparators of, of, of different countries. These are the G7s. 
there's the picture back in um, the first half of the you know 2000s decade and you'll see um, really the the big aberration there is Japan you know the Japanese miracle economy uh, went pear shaped during that period everybody else steaming away uh, Canada recovering from some blip I can't remember what the blip in Canada was but um, whatever it was, there was a, a change of, of government, total change of economic um, policy, and they bounced back up. So the story internationally, everybody, you know, really happy, 2006, aren't we clever? And then if you update that um, following the kind of crash, um, you'll see that um, this again, you make up your own mind about what, what it means politically. Um, Japan stays where it, it was. Um, Italy is in the G7, Spain, Greece aren't, so their figures would be even worse. But you see, the, Italy and the UK uh, really took, took the hammering in terms of, of wage growth. Um, so these are the kind of numbers that people pour over and they look at the different policies in different countries. So if, if you're a kind of international macroeconomist, what you're looking at things like this, this is just wage growth, but there are other things you could look at, as to what story does it tell about the outcomes linked to policy? So if you've uh, had a, an early intervention um, stimulus policy, and you see a totally different picture from the UK, then if you're that way inclined, you'll say, see, we told you so, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, figures largely in the discourse. And then the context, um, I'm nearly done, political context and mode of presentation. Um, there are many ways you can present data, right? If you present data on a log scale you, and you see differences, they're order of magnitude differences. It's 10 times or 100 times or whatever. If you're only interested in really big things like, like earthquakes, you measure them on a log scale, right? You don't, don't matter it's 2.2 or 2.3 you're interested in 10 times or 100 times or whatever so um, how you can't measure and present it's all legit you know it's a graph and if you understand it you know what's going on but it could be quite sensitive what you do so I'm going to show you national infrastructure plan in the UK these are investments in um, major sectors. So you can't read it, but I'll do left to right. The first one is, is communications. Second one is energy. The third one is flood. And this is why I'm showing this one. Uh, intellectual capital, transport, waste, and water. All right? So there's a national kind of infrastructure plan where relative amounts are invested uh, in these different areas. And as you can clearly see from that picture, those who say that we were ludicrously underinvesting in flood protection are wrong. Agree? Look carefully at the scale on the left hand side. All right, it's an order of magnitude logarithmic type scale. Next slide, I'm going to show you the actual amounts of money. Remember, flood is third from the left. Point made. They're both, you know, if you can read a graph, they say what they say. But the context here was about actual amounts of money being invested in the different bits of infrastructure. And to claim that one has invested heavily in flooding is just a bit difficult. And if you followed the news today, including the Today program first thing this morning, the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State for the Environment have been claiming <coughs> that this government has spent more on flood protection than the previous government. It is not true. And today, Andrew Dilnot, as the chair of the authority, put in the public domain a letter back to the MP who complained about this claim. And the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State for <coughs> the Environment have been shown to be misusing it. So that's as topical as I can get. Um, the former chair of the parliamentary select committee that um, 
looks at this, um, he <coughs> has said, I mean, I'm, I'm, this is now boasting about the authority, right? That, I mean, it has established itself as, as principled, proportionate, and independent. And um, despite everything over the last few years, it has helped, I think, re rebuild trust in government statistics. The current um, chair of the committee is Bernard Jenkin. And um, I think what, what he says here is, is rather sweet, actually. He says, I can reliably attest um, the interventions of the authority have been regarded with a mixture of fear and outrage in, in Whitehall. So I'm very happy to be regarded uh, with a mixture of fear and outrage in Whitehall. When I was asked to chair this, chair this, I thought was it was a sort of normal kind of um, uh, uh, little job. Uh, actually, it's been one of the most fascinating talks I've heard, and it sounds to me as though your authority is one of the healthiest bits of the uh, body politic at the moment. Uh, you know, we have role models on television of um, used to be always policemen, and recently it's been crime scene investigators who seem to always to have replaced policemen. Um, well, certainly I don't think it should be um, policemen after some of what we've heard. Um, but frankly, I think all the programs about crime scene investigators should be replaced by programs about statisticians. Um, <laughs> so, um, th so that was just terrific. Um, uh, we've time for um, a few questions. Everyone's welcome to pile in. Um, um, see, Christine. Um, I naturally have some in mind, but I think that the audience should... Um, have priority, so please don't feel inhibited. Uh, Philip, yes. Uh, I've, I've got a couple. Um, and the, the first one is really, it is probably not enough to do with statistics itself, but as a political historian, it's, uh, it's, it's the thing that I was thinking about all the, all the time. I mean, I, maybe I've spent too much time reading the Alistair Campbell diaries. But this idea of this, you know, the statistics authority that appears as a sort of new boy in the West, this brutal Westminster uh, Whitehall village, and is able to kind of, you know, protect its autonomy almost, almost immediately, and you know, is almost immune from pressure from the prime minister's office and from the other you know, powerful departments. Um, if this is true, how did how was it managed? And how did manage that how did they manage to do this so quickly to kind of ring fence themselves well, as a new institution? Okay, so I do that first. I mean, it was set up as a by an act of parliament. So this isn't some grace and favour thing that ministers go along with for a while. It's an act of parliament. And along with it goes a code of practice in how departments should use figures and the role of the statistician and the protection afforded to the individual civil servant statistician by the role of the national statistician and things. So answer one, enshrined in legislation, but you will say that's fine, but you know it must have taken politicians a while to kind of adjust to the culture. True. So there's a learning curve at the beginning where the first chair, Michael Scholar, and actually I was deputy chair right at the beginning, but then when I moved into biz, I had to give it up because I'd have been monitoring my own you know, stats. Um, we, we had to learn sort of how to do it because when it was set up, you know, we got a lo dozens of letters, you know, in the first week complaining about everything in sight. So there was a danger you'd become a knee-jerk kind of watchdog forever writing letters to ministers. And it would lose its effect if you did it too often. So you had to be very selective. But as soon as you did the first one, it changed the culture completely because ministers suddenly realized that you, you know, if they sent you a note saying, I don't want that published on, you know, you'd put it in the public domain and they'd be in terrible trouble. So um, they quickly learnt, and the whole point really is not that you're constantly writing to ministers for bad behaviour, but the fact that you could stops the bad behaviour in the first place. And it, it's worked. The legislation was fundamental. Yeah. Um, can I ask you a second question? But, I mean, there's clearly a relationship between 
the government's ability to collect accurate data and government policies. And I just maybe if you could reflect a little bit on that. Now, just and to give you an example, I mean, in the late 1980s, the government introduced the poll tax. Hmm. I mean, I don't know in great detail, but anecdotally, I imagine that that had an immediate impact on your ability to, uh, the, the willingness of people to make information available to government, and maybe in the census. Um, and it certainly did in student houses in Oxford True. in the late 1990s. Sure. Yep. Um, and you talk about you know, medical records. OK, there's an issue, of, a broad issue of privacy. But if the government introduced a particular policy about you know, people who have more than three units of alcohol a day, or in you know, various other medical conditions, then people obviously would be, would be very, very protective more than they are now. So it, presumably that's something that the authority thinks about and talks to government. Um, yeah, it's... It comes and goes, doesn't it? I mean, there's, there's a heightened sensitivity at the moment, probably because of Snowden and NSA and, and so on and so forth, right? But these things come and go. Genetically modified crops, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I mean, l let me say, genetically modified crops are a wonderful thing that saves billions of lives and feed people, right? But Frankenstein food, ba dum ba dum ba dum. It's gone. That's gone. You see, the 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 mood came. People tore up things in the field. Now they go off and tear up something else. So, you know, these things come and go, and so you've got to choose your timing. And one of the problems about using administrative data to replace census data at the moment is just that kind of sensitivity, and I, you have to respect that. So, you know, it's it's a sociological reality and so you have to deal with it it's no good saying you're silly you know we know how to protect your records um, you have to deal with it you have to engage with the culture and um, sometimes you just can't hurry these things you've got to but yeah I, you know the um, what people don't understand in, in a way it's quite technical is that you, you can't get the benefit of all these bits of data unless you link it. So you need to know that the same individual has this health data and this school data and this employment data. But linking it is not the same as anybody knowing who the person is. Because right? what you do is you encode it in some anonymized way and you're just linking the code. Um, so I think it'd be perfectly possible educationally to get that over. But then people realize, you know, Barclays Bank have just lost 10,000 records or something. And, and so you've got the problem that if something is on a disc or, um, and that's harder to, to kind of get over. Um, but see, the health one, you know, the press is talking as though this is some new revolutionary terrible thing. The hospital data has been used this way for the last 20 years. And nothing's ever been lost, nothing's ever been gone. All, all you're doing is adding the GP to um, So I think a process of education, but it, you can't be sort of smug or condescending about it. If people have fears, they have fears, and you have to deal with them. Uh, question at the back. Yeah, a couple of points. One is, <clears throat> I think Scandinavia uses administrative data rather than census, if I'm not mistaken. Quite a few countries in Scandinavia. And I read an article about comparing the two, and it was really interesting. Uh, Kind of the pros and cons, being the pros and cons. Um, second point, I moved here from Canada a couple of years ago, so I really understand the examples you gave, especially with regards to the census. And um, <clears throat> it affected the organization I was working for, which is a small think tank, uh, because that's the kind of data we rely on uh, to do a lot of our policy audits and so on. So it was really interesting. and. So there's a short form sense which is voluntary and there's a long yeah. form sense which is compulsory. Yeah. And it's given to a different like one in twenty and one in five and so yeah. on. And it's really interesting to go through the debate that went on when they made it also voluntary, the long form, because they said it was privacy issues and that people didn't want to disclose, you know, how many bathrooms they had in their house and so on. Mm. 
But you know, they spun it. It, it was it was a spin put on it that it was ideologically again antithetical to uh, values. But I think what's also quite obvious if you just dig a little bit deeper is the people who will not fill out the census if it becomes voluntary are the people who actually um, not needed the most in as much as uh, they're from constituencies who are marginalized, uh, especially yeah. for example native uh, native people yeah. and poor people, homeless people, so on. Um, so that was a really interesting debate if people want to pursue that. And uh, my question to you was, um, I'm really fascinated by the crime survey you were talking about. Can you maybe just talk a little bit more, for example, what, what is the sample size, how is uh, representativity uh, ensured? Ah. <laughs> um, I'm going to disappoint you on the last one. I, I, I honestly don't know what the current thing is, but that's one where if you do go into the website and you look at the, the, the crime survey for Wales and England, um, then you can get precisely that, that information. It has some deficiencies in that it doesn't survey um, institutional living. So old people's homes or student residences are not surveyed. So that's one deficiency. And the law at the moment doesn't allow you to interview under 16-year-olds. So we know there's a lot of mobile phone theft in early teens. But these are recognized deficiencies that you can actually kind of compensate for. But I, I, sorry, I don't, I don't remember what the, the sample size and the coverage is. But um, it's interesting you mentioned Canada. Canada, um, by reputation, has one of the best national statistics um, offices, and they often lead the way in these matters. So the gang that's been looking at alternative to the censuses has studied the Canadian experience in some detail. Yeah, the, I mean, the commissioners have done, Mr. Sheikh, I believe, over this uh, while I was still there, and this whole brouhaha went on, and said, you know, and protest these stuff down. Yeah. Your, your point about um, voluntary, compulsory, etc., etc., I mean, the non-response to a conventional census is hugely correlated with deprivation. Um, and so the, the, you get precisely this thing, that the, the libertarian, it should all be voluntary, uh, you, you will end up not capturing that end of the, the, the spectrum. So it's, it's quite a thing. But to make... To make surveys other than the census compulsory, it actually in this country needs legislation. And, and, and not, not being unpleasant to the current government, I think it's totally understandable. I don't think anybody wants to get into controversial legislation this side of the 2015 election. So we, we have further issues to debate going forward if we're to use this data effectively. <coughs> yes. Um, I would like to research about the effects of particular inclusive policies. Do you think there is any chance to study um, to link information about educational health in a particular population respecting the, the confidentiality of the individual? There is any chance? Well, to oversimplify slightly, we know precisely how to do it. But it does mean linking stuff from different databases. So, you know, the health database has all this stuff in it, but it's completely anonymized, okay? The education one has all the stuff in it, but it's completely anonymized. To link the two, so, so the presentation to the, in the public domain for the health and the education will be aggregate data. All right? So it will tell you the percentage of the population who did this, this, and this. The stuff you're interested in, you need to know that that item in the education database links to that item in the health database. Right? So to link, you've now got to de-anonymize, code, stick those codes back together. We know exactly how to do it, but it, it would need an act of parliament because at the moment, the law says the data collected for this purpose has to be anonymized and not used for another purpose. So it needs a fundamental primary legislation to enable you to do that. Well, there's an institution where I can send the first 
um, the first group ID, something like that, and they can cross the data and, the, and they just give you the results. They can give you it aggregated and anonymized. So, so the basic law says that wh when you collect data, when you communicate it or present it, it's got to be at a level that you can't work out who it referred to. So just, just imagine you had a big table and one bit was family size and the other bit was income or something. And the family size had eight or more children as the top category. If there's only one family in the neighborhood with eight or more children, you know everything about them and you're not allowed to do that. So you've always got to aggregate at a level where you can't work out who's in that cell. Thank you. <laughs> and you can see why you want to do that. Right? Yeah. But the linkage thing is still, you, we know how to do it and totally anonymize and re-aggregate the two-dimensional education and health, but the law said you could only collect that data in the health bit and that bit, promising you won't use it or give it to somebody else. Yeah? Right. My question relates to linkage, because actually I've been communicating with the UNS um, about some responses to a survey and uh, all anonymized responses, and yeah. it would help me enormously if I was able to link the responses. But I've been told that the data hasn't been stored in a way that linkage is possible. So to me it seems, while I understand that linkage might uh, in some way reveal an identity which actually would yeah. be impossible but because yeah. of the nature of the data, it does seem rather strange that the data isn't stored in a way that linkage would at least be possible. Yeah, well this, this almost goes back to my coverage heading because, you know, think times change, things change. And when you thought the rules of the game were you can, own, you can collect it, but you can only present it in an aggregate thing, you know, why would you store all the labels? You know, you just produce the histogram and that's the end of the story. So if we now have pot potential for linkage through legislation in a few years time, this will imply we need now to keep the codings as it were. Um, but no, it wasn't done because this, this data is only two years old. Yeah, but, but the law is still... So it can't, okay, no, that's fine. That's, I guess that's my question. So currently, data that is being collected now, in with the current legislation, it's possible to collect it and then collect it again. Is that what you're saying? Well, it will depend, it will depend on the potential thing. And I, I, I can't say for sure. I mean, it would be very sensible if people did what you, you, you said. Um, but, you know, if they're doing a one-off study and they thought, you know, you're not allowed to do it for anything else, why would they? But I, th I think it, it, it's now kind of obvious that that is silly. So I'm, I hope people are... Well, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because you can't, as the Office for National Statistics, go around saying, I'm sure everybody will see sense in a few years' time and do the legislation. You, you can't operate that way. So we have to take the law as as it is, um, and the, the issue you, you raise is, is it's frustrating, because we could do so much more if we weren't. Uh, so you know, I, I, start I lobbying for the change in legislation. <laughs> no, I, well, I appreciate that the cross-referencing, the cross-service yeah. is one thing. I just thought, within a survey, understanding how many people thought health was important and how many people thought Economic well, I, I don't know what answer you've got from, from ONS. I think they, these may depend just on the way particular surveys were set up and the rules of the game. But, okay. yeah. Thank you very much. How, how on earth do you calculate the gross national product? <laughs> I mean, how can you know something like that? Well, it's the, um, you know, the sum total of goods and services that's produced. And so... Um, you have measures of output from businesses, you from have businesses. retail, well, it's a sample. Okay, you sample businesses. It's a sample. And so it really depends on keeping the same structure of sample from one to the other to give you a relative. You've now raised a very interesting point because ideally that's exactly what you'd want a comparable thing, yeah. but the nature of the economy changes. changes. So if you've got dot-com companies yeah, that you yeah, didn't yeah. have a few yeah, years yeah, ago, yeah. so you constantly have to be modifying So there's lots the of scoping. judgment. Call. It's not really a mathematical question. It's a 
there's there's so a almost a sociological historical analysis. Well, the, the the mathematical thing in some sense is you want you want a representative coverage yes. of what's going yes. on. So if there were now <coughs> twice as many dot com companies as steel companies, you and you've got a finite sample that you can use, you'd put more of the sample in yeah. that bit or that. Sure. Or you yeah. do it by the volume of turnover or, or yeah. whatever. So you must be analysing all those things. Yeah. 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 So it's not easy. Very skilled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, in that case, um, I can really say from the heart that uh, that was not only fascinating, but really, really impressive. So thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs>